Well, it's my honor to introduce Gary Hodderson. Um, uh, Gary found radical women in the heydays of the feminist movement, and in those days there were a lot of socialists, anarchists, you name it, women's groups to choose from, and we're all very lucky that Gary chose us. Um, she was already, at the time she joined, she was already a veteran of the Berkeley free speech fights. Um, she had been a member of SNCC in Mississippi, registering people to vote, um, and she, an anti-Vietnam War um, activist. Uh, Gary is always where the action is. <laughs> Uh, she has been a leader in this organization for decades now, and she is the international chair of the Freedom Socialist Party, um, our sister organization, as I said. Um, and when I talk about where the action is, in the early 90s, there was a lot of uh, right-wing organizing in this area, and that's not to be surprised because the Aryan Nation had an established compound in Idaho and this was supposed to be the white homeland, this our Washington, Oregon and Idaho. And uh, they were organizing heavily. Um, Gary uh, was one of the founders of the United Front Against Fascism. And um, UFAF, and there's some veterans of that here too tonight, um, spent a decade uh, smashing attempts by the Aryan Nation, the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazi skinheads, um, Holocaust deniers like David Irving to um, get a foothold in the Northwest. Everywhere they showed up to try to organize, UFAF was there to bust up their meetings and did it most successfully. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Thank you. All right. So welcome all tonight. I'm glad you came out on this beautiful, uh, sunny summer evening to talk about fascism, which is <laughs> kind of incongruous with the, with the weather we're having, but it shows you're really dedicated and serious people who really care, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, very glad that you came. Thank you for coming. Uh, we thought about calling this uh, uh, talk, uh, you know, the rise of creeping fascism, but we we decided we liked better stand up to fascist creeps. <laughs> But they're both true. <laughs> it's necessary. It's a, it, it is, there is creeping uh, fascism, as we'll talk about tonight, but there's a, it's also necessary to stand up to them. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about uh, United Front Against Fascism and tell you some of the history uh, if in the Northwest of fighting Nazis, because there are an awful lot of lessons that were learned in the organizing that radical women did. And I realized when I started talking on the talk that um, there are people in our organization that don't really know the history and uh, I, th I thought it would be very good to share that with you tonight and I have a short a video clip of news coverage from our uh, early uh, organizing and then later I'll talk more about some of the things that are going on now that the murder of Dr. Tiller and, and other, there have been nine murders uh, by people with uh, affiliations to white supremacists uh, in, since the beginning of this year, which is really uh, quite unusual. But in 1998, uh, an Ethiopian immigrant named Malgeta Sarah was murdered in uh, Portland. And um, shortly after that, in December, uh, just to, the next month, the Aryan Nations, which was a white supremacist group, and uh, white Aryan resistance announced that they were going to come to Whidbey Island and hold a uh, memorial for a man named Robert Matthews who had been uh, killed in a shootout with the FBI uh, on Whidbey Island. And uh, radical women members, uh, you know, myself and others uh, said, you know, this, we can't let them come. We can't let them come and try and organize and recruit youth, which is what they were doing. They were they were concentrating on trying to get young people to become skinheads. We can't let them come to Seattle and be unopposed after skinheads have just murdered uh, a man in in Portland. And um, 
the when we made that decision, it really launched us on a decade of organizing uh, against neo-Nazis, against the Aryan nations in Idaho, right-wing homophobes like this crazy nut that came to town the other day uh, with uh, in picketed Garfield, um, anti-communists and anti-feminists who, as uh, Bernadette said, declared the five northwestern states of the United States to be uh, the white homeland and were going to export everybody who wasn't white from, or try and drive them out of the Northwest. Um, so after the murder of Seurat, we called a meeting, uh, a, a community meeting, and uh, we proposed that we hold a counter demo at the park where these Nazi skinheads and the Aryan nations were going to be uh, staying for a weekend of as one, uh, and this is an actual quote from one of the uh, newscasters, uh, uh, Seattle newscasters said, well, the uh, Aryans were planning to hold a peaceful cross burning on Whidbey Island. I, I, I am not, I didn't make that up. <laughs> I'm sure we have the footage. And um, so we held our public meeting and, you know, a lot of people came and we had a debate. What should we do? Uh, some people thought it was way too dangerous to go out and uh, picket uh, and organize against the Nazis. We should do something here in Seattle. They thought it was too confrontative. Uh, what were some of the, oh it was suicidal that was another another argument and a really healthy debate ensued in that community meeting and when the vote was taken the majority of people at the meeting uh, said we need to go out there and we can't let them come to Seattle and it's irrelevant to hold a, something down at the federal courthouse in Seattle when they're going to be recruiting on Whidbey Island uh, we voted on a name that night, which was Uni the United Front Against Fascism, and we made leaflets calling on people to join us. And we notified the press that we were going to be there, and went down to Pike Place Market and started handing out our flyers. And by gosh, it was a big issue because of the murder of Malgeta Seurat. So the press came down and covered us, and really we only had, I can't remember exactly how long it was. Was it five days? <laughs> Well, I knew it wasn't much time, but in five days, we organized a demonstration at, uh, at this state park on Whidbey Island. Um, the gay community provided the buses for us. We took four buses out to Whidbey Island. The, and the, part of the reason was that Robert Matthews, the man they were going to hold a memorial for, had tried to bomb uh, gay bars in Seattle. So the gay community felt very, uh, felt strongly uh, about the issue. Issue. Uh, World War II vets and Vietnam vets uh, and labor activists helped to provide security uh, at Whidbey Island. Uh, RW members gathered endorsements from uh, unions and uh, from community organizations. We took flyers to Whidbey Island to let the people know there what our what our plans were. Uh, we held a press conference with the NAACP and we answered all the attacks in the media. Uh, um, and there were a lot of attacks in the media. We were characterized as the ones bringing violence to uh, Whidbey Island. We were the, we were the, not, not the Nazis. They were just going to hold a peaceful camp out. And we were... <laughs> And we wouldn't leave alone. And we, yes, and we were, we were the ones, the dangerous uh, radicals. We took four busloads of uh, people, and cars were about, I would say, about 400 people uh, at the demonstration. There was a bomb threat on the ferry. We went, we went with our four buses to get on the ferry, and there was a bomb threat. The only bomb threat I've ever heard of on a Seattle ferry, and long before those goons that they've got now, now that circle the ferries constantly looking for terrorists, you know who I'm talking the, you know the militarized uh, homeland security guys. Yeah, now it's but at that time there was an actual bomb threat by <laughs> Nazis. They held the ferry up for half an hour, looked at the bottom of the ferry, and said, "Well, there doesn't seem to be a bomb, so you can go." So we got in our buses and went uh, and headed out to the state park. Um, our drivers got ticketed by the police who 
basically did not want us to come at all, considered us also the problem. They ticketed our drivers for crossing the fog line, which you may never have heard of a fog line. I didn't know, I didn't know what a fog line is. The fog line is the white line on the right-hand side of the road that keeps you from going off the road in the, in the uh, but nobody's ever, who's ever heard of a ticket for a fog line? That was harassment by the police. But we got out there and we were not shot at on the way out as the FBI had promised that we would be shot <laughs> as we <laughs> as we left the ferry on I and mean, I'm not making any of this up. This is all true. I have witnesses here in this room. There's news footage. <laughs> There's news footage, yes, that's right. So they'd predicted that uh, you know we would all you know that we would there would be sharpshooters there waiting for us that would, would get us or they would get us on the ferry. We would be trapped on the ferry. None of that happened. And they'd also, the media had made a big deal out of the fact that people at Whidbey Island didn't want us to come. We were outsider agitators coming to disrupt the peaceful, bubolic Whidbey Island. But when we got there, the first person that I'll never forget it, that was there in his, in his army uniform was a World War II vet from Whidbey Island. And he said, we are, I am so glad you're here. I'll never forget it. You never know where you're going to get uh, support. Well, what about the Aryans? Did they come in great numbers? Well, no, they didn't come in great numbers. They, tur they turned out to be a tiny group of young boys, teenagers, uh, who had been abandoned by their leaders. Uh, they were there by themselves, and uh, their big leaders didn't show up until after we had left. We picketed for three hours, waiting for the leaders to come. But at some point, we said, well, this is, you know, we can, can't picket here all night. Uh, so when we left, then the head of the Aryan Nations in Idaho came and uh, came to the, to the rally. Well, this... This demonstration was, it was broadcast all over the world. It was really quite amazing. You just, you really couldn't imagine it, but people who were traveling in Europe, uh, I remember, called me and said, my God, I saw you guys on television. <laughs> What's going on over there? Uh, and it became an international, uh, really an international symbol of resistance to the uh, the attempt of, of Nazis to, to intimidate uh, people. Um, then, following the demonstration, there, a debate ensued. And I want to tell you about the debate because if, whenever you're involved in fighting, standing up to, to white supremacists and fascists and so on, this debate always occurs. It occurs everywhere. Our radical women branches in other cities, in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, have all been involved in organizing around uh, to stand up to, uh, to white supremacists and, and to out and out Nazis. And the debate always in, it becomes the same. The question is, is it right to be a militant, disciplined, uh, multiracial, gay, straight, poor, poor and working class, uh, united militant front against the Nazis, or should we be uh, uh, more passive, and, and much nicer when the Nazis come out. <laughs> much more civil, engage in civil, uh, civil. Um, and usually this is, how th this is how the debate ensues. The cops, the FBI, the Federal Office of Civil Rights, elected officials, and liberal pacifists will all say that you should tone it down quite a bit. Uh, in our case, we also had the uh, couple of NGOs called uh, the Washington Coalition Against Malicious Harassment and also the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, which opposed militant action. Um, the Washington Coalition Against Malicious Harassment was partially funded by the police, which explains their uh, opposition. And Southern Poverty Law Center makes a lot of money scaring the bejesus out of people uh, about the threat of, of violence. The arguments that these groups uh, would make fell into basically five basic uh, arguments. 
One is we should ignore the Nazis because they're just uh, fringe groups. And if you ignore them, we heard some of those arguments when, what is the name of that Phelps. pre- Fred. Phelps, Fred Phelps. When Fred Phelps came out, there was a debate at the school. Some of the, pe- some of the teachers said, well, you should just ignore him. Well, don't, don't organize a demonstration against him. So that's one. Another one is, uh, an argument is, well, what we need to do is engage in passive, silent protests. If the Nazis march uh, down the streets, which they were doing regularly in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, the businesses should uh, close their businesses as a protest and tie yellow ribbons uh, around the storefronts. And this was the, you know, this was passive uh, resistance in a, in a statement. And, um, there was another, oh, the other thing was turn your back. If, if the Nazis are marching, you simply turn your back as your statement against, uh, uh, about, uh, against them. Uh, another argument is, well, this isn't really uh, this isn't really a civic problem. This is a police problem. So leave the handling of Nazis uh, because there are a bunch of lawbreakers up to the police. The fourth one is, well, what we need to do is outlaw all hate groups and outlaw hate speech. But hate is an emotion, not a political ideology. And who's to say what's hate? If you say, smash the Nazis, is that hate speech? Well, it depends on which side of the line you're on. If the Nazis are going to smash you and you say smash the Nazis, that's an act of self-defense. So the idea of outlawing uh, outlawing groups or outlawing hate speech, for one thing, all it does is drive groups underground. It doesn't, it doesn't expose them, which is one of the ways of confronting uh, Nazis. And finally, the worst, uh, the worst way that I ever heard uh, 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 that was advocated and actually done in Idaho was that, well, if the Nazis march, what we should do is use it as a fundraiser. We'll have people pledge money on the number of Nazis that march. So if 15 March, if 15 March, we'll, ra- we'll use it to raise money. And this will be our form of protest against the uh, Nazis. And it was called the Lemon... F- uh, uh, lemons into lemonade uh, campaign and was ad- advocated by a group and you and done by a group over in Spokane um, we uh, in UFAF and in Radical Women uh, countered all of these uh, arguments uh, with th- these things. First of all, Nazis are not any ordinary criminals. They have a clear ideology. They have, an inter- they have international organizations. They have a clear political goal, which is to rule soci- society. And they have support in high places among uh, people who agree with them. Um, but are not out about it. There's the police, uh, public officials, there's folks with money. In Idaho there was a a, one of the men who was funding the Aryan Nations was uh, a very very well-to-do entrepreneur and he was giving the Aryan Nations tons of money to print uh, materials and to keep going. Um, The only way really to the really the only way to counter Nazis, and when I go into more about what's happening in Europe, you'll realize that Nazis really do have a goal, an objective of becoming a mass movement to uh, take over governments. But the only way to defeat them is to build a mass movement to to. Uh, oppose them. That has to be the, that, that's the way to do it. Uh, you also have to educate about the danger and build a, a mass movement that's based on the trade unions to stand up to them. Why the trade unions, you ask? Because they're organized workers. And ultimately, the fascists want to divide the working class and weaken its ability to fight the bosses. The workers have a big, all, we as workers have a big stake in rejecting this corrosive and divisive ideology that's put forward by the Nazis. Because if we're divided along race lines, along along nationality lines, we can't put up an effective fight to defend our rights as working class people. UFAF was characterized as our organization, United Front Against Fascism, was characterized 
in various ways as ex left extremists, as um, gangs. One time the FBI handed out material calling us the gang from Seattle, which was kind of <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but we countered that by trying to find a middle way saying, okay, we understand that not everybody wants to engage and can engage in militant mass action. But everybody can do something in taking a stand against uh, white supremacy, uh, xenophobia, etc. So while if, if all you want to do is write a letter to the editor, that's fine. But take a stand. Don't be silent. Don't be intimidated. What, but we, what we must do is we at United Front Against Fascism are going to keep on mobilizing because right-wing extremists use terror to rule and to recruit. That, those are their main objectives. Over the years, United Front Against Fascism showed a lot of persistence, courage, and tenacity. Every December, we went to Whidbey Island uh, because the Nazis kept trying to go back and hold memorials. Finally, the state closed the park in the winter due to budget cuts, <laughs> which, <laughs> which we took a lot of credit for. And there, was one, and there was one winter, we reserved the park before they got there, before they reserved it. So that was, that we, we outsmarted them that way. And every summer we went to Idaho uh, until the Aryan nations quit marching in Coeur d'Alene. And uh, gradually, instead of fear, uh, individuals and communities began to take a stand. Because I don't know if you could really understand, but when Malgeta Seurat was killed, beaten to death by, by young skinheads, it was something that really scared the hell out of people. People were terrified. And then you have Nazis in their full regalia with their flags flying and, and marching in Idaho. People were afraid. So the 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 work that UFAP did in mobilizing communities really changed the changed the helped to change the attitude uh, of people toward what, what what is my responsibility? I, I'm not just a, an observer here. This is my responsibility. This is my fight. I have to speak up, and it really helped. The, this this change in understanding and an attitude really helped to um, undermine the Aryans' ability to recruit. I remember uh, at one of these demonstrations over in Idaho, I talked to a young man who was maybe about 18, and he said he'd been a Nazi skinhead until he went to some things where they were confronted by counter demonstrators, and he said I, they'd been telling me that they were really powerful and massive and strong. And, and he said, but then when I saw that all these people, thousands of people were against us, I started to think, well, I'm not sure I want to do this. And that was, you know, that showed the power of, you know, the power of undermining their power to recruit. Um, UFAF can't take all the credit for the subsiding of the white supremacist activity in the Northwest in the late 90s. There were a lot of factors that led to this, but we were certainly one of them. Um, the Nazis didn't look so tough or appealing to young people if feminists, gays, lesbians, and transgender people, immigrants, Jews, blacks, Roma people, or gypsies, communists, and socialists, all the people they hated and demeaned and despised stood up to them. It sort of cut into their macho presentation of themselves, <laughs> you know. So um, now I want to show n news clips from the 1988 uh, demonstration that are the, you get more of a feeling because I, I want you to to see what it was like. These are from Portland, and I want to say whenever we whenever radical women is marched against the Nazis, uh, we've always had the cooperation and support of our branches and wherever they are. They've always helped. We've always joined forces. So this is coverage, this is coverage from uh, Portland Radical Women. Authorities on Whidbey Island near Seattle are preparing for the worst tonight. They're worried tomorrow's protest by neo-Nazis and human rights groups will turn violent. 
A group of Portland residents will be among the counter demonstrators. Phyllis Burke is here with more on that story. Phyllis? Well, Julie, an estimated 200 people are expected to protest the skinheads tomorrow. About 50 neo-Nazis plan to hold a memorial service on Whidbey Island for the founder of a white racist group killed there four years ago. A small group of Portland residents will be among those demonstrators who plan to tell the skinheads to get lost. What do we need? What do we need? The skinheads are coming to Whidbey Island to honor white supremacist Robert Matthews. In 1984, Matthews died there of smoke inhalation in a fiery standoff with the FBI. The protesters are coming to Whidbey Island to confront racism head on. Adrian Weller was busy yesterday passing out leaflets, trying to persuade others to join her at the demonstration. Tomorrow, she'll have a small convoy of about 15 people heading for Whidbey Island. It's been actually fairly easy. Uh, people um, seem to feel that it's important that, to go, that they want to go, that they, they want to stop it now. But is Whidbey Island ready for either group? I'm just going to stay home and keep my kids home. A lot of Whidbey Island residents don't appreciate all of this attention, neither do the police. Law enforcement from five cities and the Washington State Patrol have been called in to assist Whidbey Island deputies. We have people on both sides very fired up about this issue, and they get together, there is the, the potential for physical confrontation. The counter-demonstrators are not going to be causing violence. That's a real twist in reality. They're going to be there to prevent violence. To find out what goes on firsthand, Channel 2 News will have a crew on Whidbey Island. Coverage of the events there will begin with a live report on our 6.30 newscast tomorrow. Julie? Phyllis, do we know what the skinheads plan to do tomorrow? Well, Julie, in the past they burned crosses at their rallies, but this is supposed to be a vigil. And the White Aryan Resistance, which is sponsoring the memorial gathering, has indicated it wants a peaceful service and a small crowd. Let's hope so. Yes. We'll find out tomorrow. That's Thank right. you, Phyllis. Good evening, everyone. A neo-Nazi gathering this weekend in Whidbey Island, Washington, is drawing more protesters than skinheads. More than 200 people showed up to demonstrate against the dozen or so skinheads on hand there. A group from Portland was up early this morning organizing for today's demonstrations at Whidbey Island. They want to confront racism head on and aren't worried about confronting the skinheads. I'm more worried about not going because if I don't go, uh, they're not going to stop. They're not going to get any weaker. So at what point do you decide to confront them? Or do you just decide to let them take over the country? I agree it's important to stand up to them and send them the message that we're not going to quietly stand by as they try and spread their hate. Now, one confrontation between a skinhead and some protesters is reported tonight. We have a crew at that rally, and we'll have a live report from Woodby Island a little later in our newscast. Good evening, everyone. About 225 people gathered at Whidbey Island State Park north of Seattle today to protest a gathering of skinheads and white supremacists. Law enforcement officials were worried about possible violence, but the day passed peacefully. Don Reese is up in Washington right now and joins us via satellite on New Star 8. Good evening, Don. Jeff, Janice, at this hour, neo-Nazi leaders and skinheads are meeting in a private campground, a group campground here. They plan a candlelight vigil later on in memory of a neo-Nazi who died during a standoff with the FBI four years ago, not too far from this campground, this state park. Now, a lot of people are pretty angry in the Northwest about this gathering, and just a short time ago, we saw and heard just how angry. Skinheads, we will rock you! It's an assault on hate. As a large number of police watch nearby, demonstrators chant, march, and carry signs, taking a stand against racism. 
This protest organized after news of a skinhead rally here spread to Seattle and Portland. I'm a musician and I don't see how anybody could possibly be racist as a musician because, uh, you know, black people contribute so much to music, you know, and uh, that's one of the many, many reasons why I think it's unbelievable. Racism is unbelievable. But uh, these people say they're frightened by the growth of racist violence. Demonstrators point to the beating death of Portland's Mulagata Sorau. In that case, three skinheads are charged with murder. And it's unfortunate that he happened to be a victim of, of racism in this country. But I think uh, it's, it's up to all of us to stand together in this struggle against hate and bigotry and uh, this Nazi movement, the thing that seemed to have uh, captured the attention of our youngsters. Skinheads don't go out looking for violence. It comes to us by the fact that we shave our head and express our beliefs. I mean, there's no denying what we are. And when someone sees us, they know what we stand for, and then they attack us usually. Forrest Bateman and Ron Herman are part that? of the reason for the protest. These two are Portland skinheads, oh, yeah. here to join racist leaders for a Robert Matthews memorial. Matthews was part of the order, a group that plotted to overthrow the government. Four years ago, Matthews shot an FBI agent while escaping arrest at a Portland motel. A manhunt led police to Whidbey Island. A standoff finally ended when an FBI flare set Matthews' house on fire, killing Matthews. I think he's, you know, to me, he's an idol. He started everything. Got the white man's race, you know, together and stand for one, you know, the whole white race. Black man was killed. In my town, Chicanos, blacks, and Asians are killing whites. Let's talk about that. Police tried to keep skinheads and demonstrators apart, but at times it was impossible. A man who says he's a member of the white Aryan resistance argued with several demonstrators as a large crowd of reporters and photographers stood by. Late in the afternoon, after busloads of protesters returned to Seattle, one of the leaders of the white hate movement finally arrived, Richard Butler, head of the Aryan Nation's church in Hayden Lake, Idaho. Patrick Henry stood for his convictions. I think Robert Matthew, in whether he was right or wrong, he stood for his convictions. Butler's arrival, the Matthews Memorial, and the presence of skinheads is making some Whidbey Island residents angry. Yeah, it makes me very mad. also makes me scared. I've got a child. I don't want my child growing up with people like that as a role model. But this is just the beginning. In April, Richard Butler plans a much larger gathering of skinheads at his Aryan Nations compound in Hayden Lake. Now, Butler has said in the past that he is very proud of skinheads, these young neo-Nazis that Portland police and other law enforcement officials say are very violent and very dangerous. Jeff, Janice? Dolan, obviously a tense situation there. What is security going to be like tonight for the vigil? There are fewer members of the law enforcement community here right now, Janice, than there were during the daytime, but there are still many deputies from the Island County Sheriff's Department. The sheriff has expressed concern uh, earlier this week. He said he wished he could have a 1,000 officers. So there are still some here, and probably they'll stay through the night if that's needed. All right, Don, thanks a lot. Don Reese reporting from Whidbey Island, where the skinheads have gathered this weekend. So you can see I didn't exaggerate. <laughs> I didn't exaggerate. So you might be wondering why would radical women, uh, you know, why would radical women want to do this work or think it was necessary um, or have the confidence to do it? Um, I think first of all the people, the membership of radical women belong to all the groups that the extremists uh, would like to exterminate. And in Radical Women, we stand up uh, for each other and defend each other. So that's first of all. It's one for all for one and one for all in Radical Women. And we're going to, we're going to stand up and fight for each other, for each other's rights. That's the first thing. Secondly, Radical Women are socialists. And we've studied history. And we know that fascists grow, fascist groups and organizations and ideas grow during uh, periods of economic crisis when people are looking for scapegoats. Um, they aren't just harmless fringe, fringe groups. They can grow into mass movements uh, 
to smash unions and the working class and do the dirty work of uh, corporate interests which are ter trying to terrorize workers into submission. This is basically what happened in Germany. Uh, first, Hitler's group was just a small group of street thugs who were recruiting on campuses. And I remember reading something that Hitler had written in which he said, in the first seven years of our organizing, we could have been stopped if we'd been met with force. Um, but we weren't met with enough force, and so we continued to grow. And why weren't they met with more, why weren't the Nazis met with more force in, in uh, Germany? Because it took many years for them to grow into a movement that was capable of uh, gaining uh, power in the government or power over the government. Well, the reason they, they didn't, they weren't met with sufficient force is that the left was divided in, in Germany and did not make the kind of united front that you really have to have. If you're going to fight Nazis, you have to have a united front on the left. And why is the left so important? Couldn't maybe just a, a you know a group of progressives and liberals uh, do this? Well, I think progressives and liberals are an important part of a united front. But the left is important to the united front because only the left, as socialists, have an analysis of Nazis as a product, a byproduct of capitalism. And there's no way to get rid of Nazis ultimately unless you get rid of capitalism. Uh, fascism grows out of the scarcity that exists in society under capitalism. There's not enough to go around. Why is there so much uh, scapegoating of immigrants today? It's because people feel, well, there's not enough to go around and the in immigrants are taking what might belong to me. So fascism is a product of, of capitalism and People on the left, or groups on the left, whether they're socialists, anarchists, Trotskyists, you know, Stalinists, whatever their ideas are, they have a basic understanding of, of capitalism and the role of fascists in capitalism. So we got, you know, there are a lot of different debates on the left and a lot of, you know, sometimes very strong disagreements on the left. But when it comes to fighting Nazis, we have, the, the left has to join together. And I think if you walk out of here tonight with any other idea, I think that's the most important one. <laughs> And there's a really good book called The Struggle Against Fascism in Germany by Leon Trotsky that, te that has a lot of the lessons from the struggle against fascism in Germany. It's, it's an excellent book and I recommend it uh, very highly. And if you just want something short, there's Leon Trotsky's pamphlet, Fascism, What It Is and How to Fight It, which is also very, uh, very educational. Um, the lesson that we learned from our organizing in United Front Against Fascism is one that, that we learned also by reading Trotsky, but we learned it both in practice and in theory and history. And that is that uh, white supremacists who espouse a fascist conspiratorial ideology are not a police problem. They're a social and political problem. And that tends to be, liberals tend to think that it's, they're, they're a, a, a um, police problem. They're a criminal problem. They're a criminal element and have to be dealt with by the police. Um, there are problem as working women and men, and as radicals, we have a really particular responsibility to stand together, whatever our differences are. Now, some of you might think that this is all ancient history. I can't believe that Whidbey Island was 21 years ago now. <laughs> Seems like only yesterday to me, but then I realize sometimes when I'm talking, I'm talking to people who weren't born in 1988, so it, it's, it's a long time ago. And Hitler's a long time ago. Maybe that's old news, you know? The Second World War was, was fought and, the, and uh, the Nazis were defeated in Germany and put in jail, and that's the end of the story. Well, the murder of nine people since the beginning of this year uh, by whites with top 
ties to white supremacist groups uh, really highlights, I think, the need for radical women to uh, look at what's going on and also to defend abortion clinics, uh, which where a lot of these far-right extremists uh, target their, their anger and their recruiting, the immigrant rights movement, where they're also trying to uh, recruit people who are dissatisfied and unhappy with the economic uh, and political situation in this country. And we have to be ready to take action again on a moment's notice. Um, two of the people who were killed last month uh, were uh, members of a Latino family, a man and his nine-year-old daughter. They were murdered in their home by rabid xenophobes uh, from the Northwest, a man and a woman. Uh, Shauna Ford uh, spoke at an event that was held in Everett in 2007 with the founder of the Minutemen, uh, Jim uh, Gilchrist. And it was an event that was attended by, and you see this is where there's the overlap, this event attended by the woman who's now a murderer, or, well, she's an accused murderer. Uh, was attended by the rally that she she held in Everett was attended by a candidate for Snohomish County Sheriff, representatives of three presidential candidates, including Ron Paul, were there, and other candidates who went to, who had, came to this forum, which was on the immigration uh, uh, issue. Well, I would be proud to say that we were there. Radical women and FSP were there, and part of a protest of that meeting in Everett. Um, and it's come out since this woman uh, was arrested, she, uh, f her name is Shauna Ford, that her, uh, the man she was arrested with for the murder has now been charged with the murder of a homeless uh, immigrant in um, Tri-Cities, I think it was, or Yakima, maybe it was Yakima, 10 years ago. So, you know, there are, there are attacks that are going on that, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but there are people who are being hurt and killed by racists that we don't even know about. I mean, sometimes I could go into that more in, in discussion because sometimes you really wonder about the things you read in the newspaper. Uh, I imagine so. That's that's uh, that's the woman, Shauna Shauna Ford. I imagine that most of you know that Scott Roeder, who killed Dr. Tiller, a defender of women's right to abortion, um, and. And, and Dr. Tiller was one of a handful to perform late-term abortions, was engaged in a long campaign of harassment and intimidation against the clinic that Dr. Tiller uh, operated. What you might not know is that uh, Scott Roeder was affiliated with a far-right movement called the Freeman that uh, do not recognize the U.S. government as legitimate because it's been taken over by Zog, the Zionist occupation government, uh, a favorite uh, anti-Semitic target. Um, the Freeman provided a lot of hard a lot of the recruits to the militia movement in the 90s and um, many of the proponents and practitioners of anti-abortion violence such as the Army of God have emerged from this stew of far-right militia neo-Nazi movements. Um, Another, another man who committed a murder that I'm sure you read about, uh, James Von Braun. He's the 88-year-old anti-Semite who killed Stephen Tyrone Jones, an African-American guard at the Holocaust Museum in June. Uh, he has a website that's still up claiming that there is a Jewish conspiracy to destroy the white gene pool and expressing what you can read in many far-right tracts, things like, and this is a quote, white men are laughed at, they're women bred by stronger men. This is a big issue with the Nazis, that we women should be bred by the right guys. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, which is the one reason why we as feminists are very much opposed to the Nazis. <laughs> we'll choose who are. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, he's a. He, I don't know. You have to make some jokes as you go along because it's just too grim otherwise. Um, the. Uh, uh, 
Another guy who was, uh, these, the, he's, he was not engaged in any of these recent murders, but Eric Rudolph, who bombed uh, two abortion clinics, which maimed staff, also put pipe bombs in gay bars. So these, um, these people are not uh, single. single issue, and they're not lone assassins, as what the newspaper always, that's always the first thing you read, is that they're, uh, they're lone assassins. What they are is the underbelly of the Fox News crowd that listened to Bill O'Reilly compare Dr. Taylor to a pedophile in Al-Qaeda year in and year out. The far-right evangelical homophobes, the abortion is murder fanatics, the white male sperm is sacred Aryans, and the immigrant hordes are taking over the country militia. They're a product of the American firsters like Pat Buchanan and the radio show Racists who trash talk immigrants and abortion providers every hour of every day in this country. The lone nut theory is used by the police to put the public to sleep. You know, it says there's nothing to worry about, you know, single wing nut at work, we're taking care of it, but we can't be asleep. It's not, that's not the, that's not the situation at all. And of course, those of us who have fought for abortion rights know that uh, the bombers and the killers are all part of the anti-abortion movement. For me, there was a period uh, in the 80s when uh, radical women went up to Everett every Saturday morning to defend it, the uh, Everett abortion cl or health, women's health clinic up there from a bunch of right wingers who would gather. We would get up there at six o'clock in the morning to stake out the best site to defend the clinic. And uh, one of the guys that was on the other line bombed the clinic in the end and was uh, escaped to uh, Canada uh, with the help of a leader of the far right in the Republican Party. Uh, so we know that the that the wing nuts and the movement, the respectables who are in the Republican Party, et cetera, are, are actually working together. In the U.S., between 1995 and 2005, there was really a decline in um, uh, Nazi Klan activity in the United States due in large part to the grassroots movement, which wasn't just here in the Northwest, but was really, uh, really took off around the country. Um, they also, the far right, the extremists also suffered some leadership splits. They robbed banks and, and shot up schools and uh, they ended up in jail, where of course they continued to recruit and they were infiltrated by the FBI. So it wasn't just UFAF and groups like UFAF that were responsible for their decline, but uh, also their own uh, problems. But they didn't go away, and um, but they didn't have the big recruiting ability that they had when they used to hold world congresses every April in Idaho. Today, the far right, the extremist right, the white supremacists, the Nazis, the national, I think it's called the National Socialists something, uh, which are Nazis, uh, are growing again in the US and across Europe. Um, the crisis of capitalism combined with massive displacement of people who are forced to flee their home countries by war, by political turmoil, by poverty and free trade are driving the proliferation of fascist gangs and movements worldwide. And the groups can run the gamut from skinhead gangs to established political parties. In June in Europe, uh, elections were held for the uh, European Parliament and far-right out, out, out and out racist parties made, a bit, made big gains in those European uh, elections. Uh, in the Netherlands, an anti-Islam Freedom Party, uh, well they call themselves a Freedom Party, won 17 percent of the vote and became the second, the second large, you know, got more, the second number of votes of any party in Netherlands. Uh, in in Italy, the Northern League, which is a far-right organization, doubled its vote. And there were several places where uh, anti-Gypsy or anti-Roma parties made big gains in Hungary uh, and Romania. And in Britain, 
uh, they elected, they got, the, the far, far right got two seats uh, in the European Parliament. And I mean, these people are Hitlerites from the National Front. Um, and they want uh, Britain for whites only. And uh, they want to expel anybody who's not white. One piece of good news is that when they, when they held their press conference to announce, uh, you know, or to talk about their election, there were people there from United Against Fascism who threw eggs at them, and they had to leave. <laughs> They, they never finish their uh, they never finish their press conference. So, but that small comfort when you think about uh, how I think it was they they got a million votes. Uh, so that's you know bad news. In our hemisphere, just to to wind up here, in our hemisphere, the passage of NAFTA in 1992 drastically increased immigration from Mexico. Uh, as the economic situation there deteriorated and free trade agreements in the rest of Central America had a similar impact uh, and immigration from Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua also grew. At the same time, the free trade policies uh, affected workers in other ways. Well-paid jobs uh, in the heavy industry were lost, unemployment rose, and outsourcing resulted in the loss of union membership. <clears throat> Immigrants became the scapegoats for all those frustrating developments, even in the labor movement, where for a, a period, uh, workers without papers were seen uh, as scabs because they worked before, below prevailing wages, which was in construction. And there was a battle in the labor movement to get the labor movement to, to defend immigrant workers and uh, to some degree, we won, and I think somewhere we have a resolution here that we that we uh, worked on and passed and got unions to adopt. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, to to defend immigrant workers as an important part of the working class, and. We, we managed in Washington State to get the Washington State Labor Council to adopt that, and other states adopted it, and the AFL-CIO turned around somewhat. But the labor movement is still not defending immigrant workers from ICE raids and from, uh, you know, roundups and uh, other things, and I think there's much more that the labor movement needs to do, partly out of a sense of self-survival, because the immigrant Immigrant workers, with and without papers, are the most militant section of the working class today. And it's in everybody's self-interest to defend them because it will strengthen uh, the labor movement. Uh, however, the effects of, of, um, of, of free trade, increased immigration, uh, more frustration among uh, uh, native uh, workers here in this country was then followed by, in 2001, the attack on the Twin Towers. And the Bush administration whipped up the fear of, t of terrorists, Muslims and Middle Easterners. And so now anti-immigration attitudes were, and scapegoating were linked up with terrorism. Now it's, we gotta stop the terrorists coming across the border illegally. Uh, nationalism and racism became the incendiary mix out of which the far right has grown over the last few years. Today, the neo-Nazi movement is rebuilding itself on fear, fear about immigration, fear about the election of the first African-American president. And if you read some of the websites, this is a constant uh, refrain. Uh, that we may, uh, you might remember, not too long after uh, Obama was elected, there was this thing, Obama's gonna outlaw guns. We, it was like, it was a wild rumor, but the far right jumps on it uh, and uses it to, to, or, to organize. I also think fear of gay marriage 
has also, I mean, I was really shocked to read the statistics about attacks, on, which I did for this talk, but I didn't include them all, but attacks on gays and lesbians and transvestites. I mean, it's really, it's gone up since I think uh, the, the gay marriage movement has been pushing, has been pushing forward. I think there's fear about disobedient women. We're always a cause of worry for a great many uh, people. Uh, or, and uh, all of this is seen as, as uh, signs of moral decay in a once proud country ruled by superior whites. So some of the Nazis have taken off their uniforms and they're trawling the anti-immigrant movement and the internet looking for likely recruits to their conspiracy theories, their Armageddon scenarios, and the mythology about nat the natural superiority of straight, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Amid the current economic uncertainty and skyrocketing unemployment, they will find recruits among the habitually unemployed and the frightened uh, middle class. And one of the things when I was uh, doing, thinking about this, I looked into unemployment, and Oregon has the second highest unemployment in the country. And wherever there's unemployment, that's where Nazis go to organize. When the forest industry began to go downhill in Washington State, the Nazis headed out to the uh, to Fork and to other places where people were unemployed and began trying to organize out there. So we can bet that they're also going to be going to Michigan, where which has the highest unemployment rate, and uh, trying to recruit. That's that's their their method. I think our job is as radical women is to offer working and poor people and, and as not just radical women but as, as radicals, all of us, regardless of whether we're members of radical women or not, is to offer working and poor people an alternative message uh, to that that is offered uh, by the Nazis and the means for fighting for what we need. Our message has to be class solidarity and defense of the most vulnerable as an expression of self-defense. You know, we always in Radical Women say we have the right to self-defense. We're not going to roll or let anybody roll up over the top of us. Uh, it says that isn't going to help the world make the world a better place. Um, we have to show working people why and how we can replace this system with a more humane socialist system that will do away with the private uh, the deprivation that leads to the rise of fascism. And we must show the courage to stand up against the bullies and the terrorists of the far right. And I'm glad to say and proud to say that Radical Women is such an organization with a long history of doing just that. <laughs>